scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Ephesians. If you want to turn there well, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the word of the Lord says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray once more. Lord, I, I ask that you would anoint the reading of your word in our hearts. I ask that your word would be a light to us in times of darkness. A guide to us when we need navigation. A peace that passes understanding. And simply a touch of your spirit and your presence alive and at work within us. Heavenly Father, you know what we need before we need it. You know the cravings of our hearts, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I pray that your word would work within us to accomplish your purpose and your task and your will. God, be alive in our midst this morning. Be alive in us individually. Be alive in us collectively. And as we go from here today, may we be transformed by your word. And Heavenly Father, I simply pray that that how we discuss it, how we talk about it, how we break it down, how we interpret it, would be true to how you intended it to be in our lives. Work within us in a way that only your spirit can do. So it is not our doing, but you within us for kingdom purposes. God, when others see us, we want them to see you. So work within us to that end. Take this time and make it something that only you can do. And that's make it holy, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Just so we're all on the same page, we're actually, it's first, first Sunday in February. We're beginning a new sermon series this week. Um, it's entitled Dimensions of God. It's a two-month sermon series. Through, for February and March, we're going to be going through select parts of the book of Ephesians in chapters 2 through 6. So if you're ever wondering what to do on a Saturday night because you absolutely have nothing to do, my suggestion to you would be open up your Bible to the book of Ephesians and read through it because I know that's what you all want to do on a Saturday night. Okay, uh, somebody's getting humor, that's good. All right. But I, seriously, if you have nothing to read in your devotions, if you're not sure where to get in the Bible, I would suggest getting into Ephesians this, this time. We're talking about dimensions of God, and God's dimensions are not anything that we can ever fully wrap our heads or our minds around. Right? So, so let's come to the conclusion right now that this is not going to be like everything you ever want to know about God and fully understand, because that is completely impossible and will never happen. The goal is to find out how God is working in our lives and can use us for his purposes. The main part we're going to be focusing in on, the best way to sum it up, is in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. It simply says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, 
They have the power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's where we're heading in the next two months. Two months. And that's your brief overview so you know what direction we're going to be going. Starting in today, today's message, I'm going to ask a simple question. It's rhetorical. Is where do you come from in life? Because we all come from different places in our lives. And when I think about that question in my life, my childhood, my, not, my, not my adolescent years, but my childhood from the time I was about two years old or remember anything till I was about 10 years old was spent at 1755 State Street, East Petersburg, Pennsylvania, 17520. I still remember that house. It's where I grew up. All right? And if you're wondering where East Petersburg is, it's in Lancaster County. It's in the Hempfield School District. If you, if you break down the Hempfield School District, there's six parts. You got Centerville, Landisville, Roarstown, Mountville, Farmdale. And then like the armpit of the district is East Petersburg. Okay? If you were comparing it to this area, you'd be, well, I'll keep that. Never mind. Um, <laughs> give you something to talk about today at lunch if you've got nothing else to talk about. What is the armpit of KCSD? Anyway, um, we grew up in a centuries-old house. It was a two-story house. Um, used to be a big farmhouse. Had, a, you know, one of the old wood floors, wind blowing through the windows, through the rafters, squirrels living in the attic. Our basement was, uh, was a ground, a dirt floor. Then we covered it with stones, and when it would rain real hard, we'd get in. You'd get water in the basement, see how well the sump pump was kicking on. I can remember one time we actually had about four, four and a half feet of water in the basement. It was literally halfway up the steps to the first floor. I thought that was cool. I'm like, Mom, I can go swimming. I wasn't allowed. Um, you know, it is what it is. Used to walk or, or ride bike to East Pete Elementary School, which was about half to three quarters of a mile up the road. It was great when I got old enough. You could actually jump up and touch the speed limit signs. Like, just cool things about your childhood that you remember. Had a big, couple big walnut trees out back, so we collect the walnuts every year in the fall. Rake up huge piles of leaves, jump into them off of mattresses and the little rebounder things. We had one of them. We had a swing in the backyard. We had rings in the backyard. We had a tire swing in the backyard. We had a big sandbox in the backyard and even a... Uh, even a little play set over that when I was a kid. I remember because I fell off the slide and onto the tire. Our sandbox was a big tractor tire with sand in the middle. It was the first time I ever knocked the wind out of myself. I remember thinking, so this is how it goes down. This is how I'm going to die. Right? You fall off onto that. I've never had that. And all of a sudden, I can't breathe. And I'm in the backyard just going, all right, for about 10, 15 seconds until it finally comes back to you. Um, we, we loved playing that backyard. There was a barn in the back, and on the back side of the barn was a basketball net mounted to the barn. So we played basketball like Indiana style, like you'd see in Hoosiers on the grass and on the dirt. If you go out to the alley, that was like the three point, which we shot a lot of because you were actually shooting from a hard surface at that point, but we loved playing back there. Um, there was just so many things that I, when I think about my childhood and, and where I came from that, that I kind of relate to. One of the things I loved about the house was at the top of the steps on the second floor, you get to the second floor, my sister's bedroom was left, mine was to the left further, my parents' was right, but right in the middle where I went back to the hallway to the bathroom was this big heat register, and in the wintertime, we crowd around that heat register, like, especially after you got out of the shower and were warming up, and, and then after that, we'd usually hop on our pillows and ride down the stairs to the first floor, you know, and you ever do that, but you, it, the way the house, there was no landing. It was basically straight into the wall, so maybe that explains some things about us. I don't know, right? I loved when my dad coached baseball because we'd ride to baseball games. The team in the back of dad's pickup truck, I don't know, you, my kids unfortunately can't relate to that at all, and I'm talking no cap. You just pile the team in the back of the pickup truck and ride. It was wonderful. I wish we could still do that, right? We weren't rich. We weren't rich, but I never, considered our, I never considered us poor. Like, we always had enough for what we needed, plus a little bit more, right? It, it, that, that, was, that was my childhood. That's where I come from. That's, that's my upbringing. And, and guys, I wouldn't change a thing about it. And I'm guessing that many of you have your own story. You all obviously do, but some of it you can relate to mine, and some of it you can't even remotely to. We all come from different places, but my guess is that you probably wouldn't change much about your upbringing either. You see, where we came from, our roots, the circumstances that we endured, all are part of what brought us to where we are today, both individually and collectively as a congregation, right? 
So, so even though we come from all these different places and we come from all these different circumstances and situations, as we meet here together today, we even come from different places on our faith journeys. We're all at different places in our walk with Christ. But we all started at the same place. Like it or not, each of us came from a life of sin. Verses 1 through 3 tell us that. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Check this out. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the, des- the cravings, the desires of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. The simple translation is this. Every one of us is sinful beings. All of us. Now, I say that with a full understanding that that is antithetical to just about everything you will hear in our world and in our society. We're fed the the line how good we are, how worthy we are, how much we deserve stuff, right? Right? But what I'm saying about being sinful beings of all starting from that same place is completely in line with the word of God. It's very consistent. Jesus was approached by a rich young ruler one time and he says to him, he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus' response to him was? Why do you call me good? Jesus himself says, no one is good except the Father. Right? Right? Romans 5.12, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Or if you jump a little further down in chapter 5 of Romans, he says, consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as though the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners... So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. King David, chapter 51, verse 5 of the book of Psalms, says, I was born sinful at birth. And I understand that not everybody would agree with me on this. As I was doing some research and some reading for the, for the message this week, I came across a Christian article. That, that The conclusion that this author draws, here's what he says. He says, is humanity good or evil? We are neither. We are neither good nor evil. We are humans. Humans do good things and we do evil things. All of us, because we are in the image of God, desire to do good and all of us do good at times. Some of us have a much stronger desire to do good, but all of us desire to do good. But doing good things does not make us good. Also, doing evil things does not make us evil. Evil is not a thing and good is not a thing. Things we do are good or evil, but we are not good or evil. And guys, what that means to me is that this dude is so rife with political correctness, it makes me want to puke. That's what it means. He's writing an article to not offend everybody. He's writing an article not to offend anybody, which makes his writing crap, in my opinion. Excrement. Like, there's nothing about that that even makes remotely sense. Because by trying not to offend anyone, he is offending the gospel of Jesus Christ. God created people, and it was good. That is correct, and I agree with that. But people sinned and created a chasm between themselves and God. And all of humanity has dealt with that ever since. Because of that chasm, Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Christ came along and the blood of Christ was required as a bridge between the Old Testament covenant and us meeting with God. Hebrews chapter 9 says, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. God came to earth in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, to take away your sins, your sins, my sins, the sins of all of humanity. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for our sins, which leads right into verses four and five of this passage. 
Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You see, God provided, check this out, this is awesome. God provided a way for us to draw close to him when we wanted nothing to do with God. God provided a way for us to draw close to him before we even needed a way to draw close to God. God built that bridge when no bridge was there. God built that bridge when no bridge was even necessary, except God said at some point this bridge will be necessary, so I'm going to build it. It makes me think about Noah and the ark. I would have loved to have been around when Noah began to build the ark. I would not have loved to have been around when Noah completed the ark. Let's make it clear, right? But when Noah started building this ark, he was given instructions from God. You see, God said to him, I'm done with humanity. It's the level of sin. I can't deal with them anymore. And so I'm going to send this calamity on. But Noah, you're righteous, so I'm going to save you and your family. If you build this boat, this ship that I have designed, here's the specifications. It's a football field and a half long. All right, go up to the stadium at Central Mountain. Start against the edge of the cliff. Build it a little bit past the field house there on the other side. It's going to be enormous and massive. All right, it's going to require all this stuff. It's going to take you years to build. We don't know exactly how long it took Noah to build the ark. Best estimates are between 50 and 100 years. Half a century to a century of him working on building this boat. Do you realize that we have no indication that Noah lived anywhere near the water? We have no indication there was any natural body of water near him. If you were around Noah at that time, if you were a neighbor of his or a friend of his, what would you have think to yourself about Noah? Dude has lost his mind. Right? This guy is crazier than a dog at a hubcap factory. He's nuttier than a squirrel turd. His elevator does not go all the way to the top floor. He's missing some screws, right? Because what he is doing makes absolutely no sense. He's sacrificing the comfort of his life, of his family's life, of the resources that they have for what? Absolutely nothing. Because we don't need a boat. A boat is not necessary, especially a boat of this size. Until it is. A boat was completely unnecessary until it was. Right? God instructed Noah to build that boat because God knew at some point Noah would need that boat. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to earth because he knew at some point the blood of Christ would be necessary for each of us to draw close to him. God reconciled us to him or gave us the opportunity for that reconciliation before we even knew we needed it. And, and he didn't just build a way for us to draw close to him. Scripture goes so far to say that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ. Why? Scripture tells us today. In order to show us his grace. Expressed through us in his kindness in Christ Jesus. God didn't just love you enough to make a way of repentance, a way for you to draw close to him. God loved you so much that he wants to be with you forever. God made an eternal sacrifice for you to draw close to Jesus. To spend eternity alongside Christ in heaven. Why did God do that? The answer is very simple. God did it because he loves you. Now, isn't that the warm, fuzzy Sunday morning message you all came to hear, right? But why does God love you? Why does God love me? And the answer I can tell you as your pastor is, I don't know. Right? I don't know. Here's what I know to be true. I have a dog. I actually have two dogs, but I'm not going to talk about the devil dog. I'm going to talk about the one I like. I have a dog. Her name is Misty. 
Some of you have seen her before. I was actually reminiscing this week as I was writing this message. About a couple years ago, I had her actually sit on stage with me during a Sunday morning message, and she actually stayed in bed the whole time. You're like, oh, she's great. And I was surprised she did it, although obviously I had her in here to do it, so I was willing to take that stance. But Misty, for those of you who don't know, is a medium size, getting larger by the day because she's getting fat and old. Medium size hound dog. Um, life expectancy in the 10 to 12 year range. She is uh, black and brown, kind of a brindle on her chest a little bit. We got her from the pound when she was just a puppy. We didn't know exactly what she was. She is the nicest dog in the world. Like, she's just the greatest dog. And, you, and, and if you don't take my word, you don't believe me, I get it, I understand. Go to the vet. Go to Judy, the dog groomer. They would tell you, Misty is absolutely wonderful. She just loves people. She loves being around people. She's not scared of anybody or anything, which she should be more often. Her great joy in life is sniffing the wood pile for mice and chipmunks, of which she never catches, but she still sniffs. She has lost almost all of her hearing. Almost one of her eyes is completely blind. You can see it's all clouded over and stuff like that. Covered in bumps, you know, all sorts of lumps and bumps and whatever old dogs get covered in. Uh, she sleeps about 22 hours a day. She snores like a water buffalo. I don't know how my oldest daughter, Kylie, does it because she sleeps in Kylie's room. Our bedroom is right below Kylie's. When Misty is sleeping, I can't fall asleep in our bedroom when she's in Kylie's bedroom, because all I hear is right? We've been doing life with this dog for 12 and a half years, right? Now, I, it's not gonna last much longer. Like, she's in a bad shape. She can, when she stands up, she can barely walk. When she walks across the tile, she can barely do it, because like, she's just losing muscle control. So we're going to have to put her down at some point, which kind of stinks. You know why it really stinks? Because that stupid dog, for somehow, in some way, in some reason, has worked her way into my heart. I, I don't know exactly why. I don't get exactly why. I just know that for the last 12 and a half years, that dog has been part of my life. And I love that stupid dog. And I say that with affection. She's worked her way in. So why does God love you? I can honestly say that I don't know, but here's what I know to be true. That years of us being on earth are nothing compared to the eternity that God lives in outside of our time constraints. And somehow, in some way, in some shape, and in some form, you've worked your way into God's heart. God created you, he made you, he molded you, and he loves you. You've worked your way into God's heart. Crazy, right? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's God's love for us. The scriptures tell us it's true. Paul says to the Romans in chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Right? Death nor life, angels or demons, present nor future, and their powers, height nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. What does the Apostle John tell us? This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Something for nothing. You didn't do anything to deserve Jesus Christ. I didn't do anything to deserve Jesus. But God felt the need to provide a way for us to him before we ever even knew we needed it. Loving the unlovable, or maybe even the undeservable, which I'm pretty sure isn't a word, but I'm going to say it anyway. God chose to make way to us. Our faith is possible not because of who we are, but because of who God is and because of his grace and his love for each and every one of you. It's not something from yourself. It's not something you can do on your own. If you were given unlimited resources and unlimited time and unlimited opportunity, you still would not be able to create a way between you and God. That's the gist of verse 9, right? Not by works so that no one can boast. And it sounds simple and logistical, doesn't it? It sounds easy. But isn't that exactly what makes it so difficult as well? 
The Pharisees and the religious elite couldn't accept it. Their entire system was based upon what they did and how they did it. They condemned and crucified Jesus because his ways were in opposition to their ways. He didn't do the right things at the right time, in the right place. How dare you work on a Sunday? How dare you heal somebody on a Sunday? How dare you walk through the field and pick grains on a Sunday? Their system was based on the piety that they achieved from doing their things, from achieving these positions, from saying the right things, and not relationship. Don't we struggle with that as well at times if we're really being honest with ourselves? Guys, it's not about what we do for God, because if it was, then salvation could be earned. It's not about what we do for God, because if it was, then salvation can be earned. It's about living in God's grace and what God has already done for us. It's so simple, and yet so complex. You know, one of my favorite songs is by a Christian artist who passed away in the night. His name Rich Mullins. The song, the name of the song is called The Color Green. And the song is really simple. Like, I love the lyrics. The lyrics are awesome. But it's about being thankful for the little things in life, the things we take for granted. Can you imagine life without the color green? It's a lot easier now than it will be in four or five months. But even so, life, green represents life. Green represents existence. It's that rebirth, that beginning. Here's another analogy for you, the simple being incredibly complex. All right. Early in the 20th century, there's a mathematician, a philosopher, and an all-around scholar, a guy named Bertrand Russell. Maybe you've heard of him. He's a pretty famous mathematician. And I will preface this story by saying, I don't know what goes through the minds of really smart people. And this guy was one of those really smart people. And here's what he decided to do one day. He decided to prove that mathematics is, in fact, correct and the right way to be doing things. Right? Why you would do that? You have to be a mathematician by trade to start. I have no desire whatsoever to join him in that. But he got a buddy to help him out. And the guy's name was, I wrote it down here, uh, Alfred Whitehead. Between the two of them, they wrote a three-volume work on the foundation of mathematics called Principa Mathematica. Do you know what the first 83 pages of Principa Mathematica are dedicated to? using math to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. 83 pages to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Like I said, this is above most of our heads, if not all of our heads. I get that, right? We all know that 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's simple. I have two apples, right? I'm going back to kindergarten, first grade here. Two apples, take one away, I have one, right? We get it. It adds up. But there's logistics that need to be taken care of there. What looks so simple can be so incredibly complex when we really get to the nuts and bolts of it. So if you think that's weird, think about how complex and how difficult this statement is for most of us to accept. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. Wow. You can't earn your way to God. You can't earn your way to heaven. No matter what you do, no matter what your abilities are, no matter how much you want it, does not make you more or less appealing to God you have been saved by grace, so what you need to do is accept that grace. And let's be honest, by and large, we're really not very good at receiving, are we? We're good at giving. We're all willing to give to stuff to help out the other person. But how good are we at really receiving? If we're honest, it's something many of us struggle with. We like to be independent. We like to be self-sufficient. We like to take charge of a situation. But that doesn't mesh with God's plan for salvation in your life. 
Because it's not about how independent or how achieving you are. It's about God's grace. If you rely on yourself for your salvation, then your kingdom will eventually come crashing down. But if you rely on God's grace and his love for your salvation, you will be part of an eternal kingdom. One that will stand forever. You know, I had a flashback this week as I was shoveling a little bit of snow and a little bit of ice to about 15 years ago. I had an experience, I've told, talked about this ad nauseum before, so I'm not going to say it much, where I blew out my knee. About two weeks, what you don't know about this story about me blowing out my knee was, that, look, for, it was three to six months after I blew out my knee, to, I could even normally walk again without the assistance of a cane or crutches or stuff. About two weeks after the accident happened, though, we had a big snowstorm. Like, I'm talking like two, two and a half foot snowstorm. Snow. I can't stand, let alone walk. Kylie would have been about four at the time. Autumn would have been about two at the time. Luke would have been nothing at the time. <laughs> Sorry, bud. You're something now, so it's all good. <laughs> we lived in a townhouse, okay? So the townhouse, the way it was set up is you had... Two parking spots out in front of the townhouse. Then you had a fence to the yard, which was about six to eight feet wide until you hit the front door. There was a walkway going from the, from the front door stoop out to the driveway where we park our cars. Shoveling snow in that is miserable with six to 12 because there's nowhere to go with the snow. On the other side of our parking spaces are the sidewalk that you're responsible for clearing off. Everything you shovel has to be chucked into a space about that wide between the fence and the house. This was not our first snow of the year, so there's already snow piled up this high. Guess who had to shovel all the snow from two to two and a half feet? Laurie. I couldn't do a thing. I couldn't even stand up. I didn't even feel guilty about it because I couldn't even think about it. It hurt that bad. But Laurie went out. And she, I remember saying something along, I'll be in in a couple hours. Right? And I think the girls were out there playing around, helping her out, if you will. But what I remember when she, what she told me when she did come back in was that it didn't take her quite as long as she thought because the neighbors came over to help out. I didn't see it. I didn't know it. But the neighbors helped out. And she was glad to accept their assistance at that point, as I think many of us would be. All right? Do we with that same gracious and thankful heart. Accept the gift of God's grace. Accept the gift of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins in our lives as well. Why do I bring this up? Why do I think this is so important? Yes, it's the obvious reasons of salvation and eternity. Right? But it's because of verse 10. Verse 10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. He has a design for your life and is to use your life for his kingdom building purposes. Your life and your actions point others towards God. And so you are made to display Christ's image in you. You are made to point others to God. Do you know why? Because for reasons beyond my control and reasons that I can't even begin to the fathom, God's crazy about you. God loves you. He wants to experience life with you. He's just waiting for you to accept the assistance, to start shoveling off that driveway. I'll close with this illustration. We did something really cool as a family this week. Actually, we didn't do the cool thing yet. The cool thing's going to happen in uh, end of July this year. But we booked something really cool. Something that Laurie and I have been talking about since before the kids were born and since the kids were born. We are going to Cedar Point this summer. If you don't know what Cedar Point is, it's an amusement park in Ohio. It sits right on Lake Erie and is known as the, the amusement park that has more roller coasters than any other amusement park in the world. And not just roller coasters, but like the big ones, the good ones, the ones that, you, like, Knobles is cool, I get it, but it's not Knobles, right? Knobles on steroids is a footprint of Cedar Point, okay? 
And there's one that I'm looking forward to going on more than any other roller coaster there. I know I messed up the name, so I wrote it down. It's called the Top Thrill Dragster. Okay? And what this roller coaster does is you start off, it's kind of like Storm Runner. If you've ever been to Hershey Park on Storm Runner, the one that shoots you out at like 70 miles an hour, you sit down, you have the light, it's like a drag race, and this thing shoots you out for probably at least a quarter mile straight. You get from zero to 120 miles an hour in no time flat, and then you go vertical, right? The roller coaster does this. It goes up, and as it goes up, it twists, so you kind of do an inverted horse, and then it horseshoes straight back down as you twist and come straight down this way. At the height, you are four. 125 feet off the ground. And when you come down, you're actually slightly inverted. I can't wait. And here's the thing you need to know if you've ever spent any time with garments at Amusement Park, one of our annoying characteristics traits, is we always sit in the front. It's not worth riding if you can't sit in the front. That's just how we're wired. I would rather wait 20 to 30 extra minutes to sit in the front than to be staring at a headrest. That's just the way we are. You know what the favorite part is? Is when you've waited in line, no matter how long that is, right? And the coaster comes in before you, and the people get out, and you're like, come on, come on, come on. They do their thing. They finally start down the ramp. And then the gate opens, and you've got a choice to make, right? I didn't wait two hours to sit here and watch this car go empty. I got to wait two hours to sit here, put the lap belt down, and get ready for the ride of my life. Like, isn't that when your adrenaline is just cranking away? This is going to be an amazing experience that I absolutely positively can't wait for. Even though it's going to be done in 10 seconds, it's going to be awesome. And no matter what I do, I can't control what the roller coaster does at that point. The roller coaster is going to do what the roller coaster does. It's going to stay on the track, hopefully, go up top, come back down, and walk it off safe. You just never know. I mean, it's not foolproof. I hope it is. But if you're going to go out, what a glorious way. Anyway, isn't that exactly what God's inviting you to? A life unparalleled on your own with him if you simply accept his grace. Don't try and earn it. It's not going to happen. Don't try and do good works or make yourself better. He knows everything about you. He just wants you to join him for the ride. What I'm asking is, are you willing to step in that car in the first place? That's what we're going to be talking about. That's God's dimension. That's his awesome love for you. And I can't wait to get into this book further. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we... I'm excited. I just... Man, Lord. I can't imagine life without you. I don't want to imagine life without you. And I know I don't have it all figured out, and it's not perfect, and it's never going to be. But simply, Father, I want to ride this roller coaster of life with you. I want to join with you in the plan that you have for my life. I want to join with you in the plan that you have for this church and this church body. I want to join with you in the plan that you have for this community. And I pray that would be the cry and the desire of our hearts as well. God, you've chosen us for reasons beyond our control, beyond our recognition, and for, 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 most importantly, beyond our understanding. For some reason, you're crazy about us and we've worked our way into your heart. God, I pray that the same would be reciprocated on our, that you would work your way into our hearts and we would just be crazy about you, that we would not be able to get enough of you. God, when others see us, may they see your son, Jesus, through our actions, through our words, and through our life, not out of a sense of perfection or duty, but out of a sense of love because you first loved us. Thank you, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.